Uh, thank you everybody for coming to my talk. Most of you folks are online. Uh, hi, and uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Yejin Choi for inviting me, uh, not just for today, but also for tomorrow. So I'm giving the same talk again at UW CSE uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. So if you uh, want to you know, hear it again, you can <laughs> tomorrow. But uh, uh, and thank you for, for uh, thank you Tim for for hosting my my visit uh, at AI two. Uh, and as Yu Tian said today, I'll be talking about the application of computational linguistics, especially parsing algorithms and grammar formalisms, for a completely different uh, problem domain that is biology, that is RNA vir virus and RNA vaccine, especially in the context of COVID, because COVID is caused by an RNA virus, SARS-CoV two, and is kind of prevented by or controlled by an RNA vaccine, the mRNA vaccine we got from Pfizer and Moderna, right? But um, before I start my talk, uh, I would like to, to mention a few things. First of all, there's no deep learning at all, uh, or language, big language model, large language model, whatever, uh, in this talk. Uh, this is using classical computational linguistics, which, you know, folks uh, made in the dips discovery in the 1960s. So it's like 60 years before the pandemic, we kind of revived a lot of old forgotten work uh, in computational linguistics, um, kind of give them a new life in a completely different field. And secondly, nowadays, uh, uh, folks probably know people in, in deep learning much better, but uh, uh, one of my, uh, actually my first PhD student uh, was Ashish Vaswani, who was the first author of Transformer paper. So nowadays he's much, much more famous than I am. So I need to introduce me as, as Ashish's advisor instead of like Ashish as introduced as, as Leon's student. But you know, that's that's the but that's the way it should be, right? So your students are supposed to be better than you. Your students are supposed to be making new discoveries much, much, much better. Uh, so without further ado, um, so some some personal history. Um, how I come got from linguistics to biology? Well, actually it started with my PhD. At the beginning of my PhD, my advisor, uh, Ervin Joshi, who was the, one of the founders of uh, this field of NLP, he was the first winner of uh, ACO Lifetime Achievement Award. He wanted me to work on NLP applications to biology, which is you know amazing, but it's probably ahead of its time at the time. At the time, uh, he read, read a paper from Japan, which applied his grammars for language to RNA and protein structures. He was very amazed. He very excited. He said, "Oh, I wanted to work on biology now." And he hired me and two other students to work on it, but it turns out to be a, a disaster. Uh, we all hated it very much because uh, uh, we we all had you know computer science background, no no biology background at all at all, and we all love languages and wanted to work on uh, NLP. So I, I did you know a few paper, uh, a couple of papers, and and he said that's probably enough to report to NSF, and then he he let me work on whatever I want, want to work on for the rest of my PhD. So I, I left biology completely. Uh, to to just work on language, uh, which I enjoy really, but miraculously, so for about ten years, I didn't touch biology at all. After I moved to Oregon State, there was a biology colleague, uh, Dave Hendricks, who asked me a random question. He said, "Do you know this thing, you know, called stochastic context-free grammars, which can be used to model RNA structures?" I was like, "Yeah, that's exactly what my advisor wanted me to work on for my thesis, except that I just gave it up." Uh, but the time he asked me this question, I had already worked on you know, parsing and translation for the past 10 years, and I suddenly realized, wait a minute, all these algorithms from language can be applied to RNA and protein very easily because they're just languages. They're both languages. You know, RNA is another language, protein is another language. And on top of the sequences, uh, uh, like sentences, you have syntactic structure. Like in English, we have Seems to have parse, parsing trees, uh, parse trees like dependency trees, sourcing constituency trees. Uh, RNA or protein will have secondary structures, tertiary structures, and so on and so forth. And these synthetic structures look exactly like I don't know where should I point here. Uh, exactly like the you know dependency or constituency trees that we have built for for English and Chinese. And the impact of this application will be much bigger than the original impact in language because just because the sentences are much longer. The sequences are much longer in biology. For example, in COVID, the sequence length is 30,000 words or letters, but each letter is a word, ACGU, each letter is a word, right? So you, you never get sentences that long. Well, you, you get discourse, right? Uh, I think it was uh, Valentina who, who, who was working on discourse parsing. 
discourse can be very, very long. You can parse the whole book, the whole chapter or whatever. Like we talk about long context windows nowadays uh, in large language models. It's very hard to do in large language models, but it's very easy to do uh, with parsing algorithms. Like the beginning, the first word and last word in a sentence are very far apart on a sequence, but they are very close by in the syntactic tree. And same thing here in biology, like the you know very first nucleotide and the very last nucleotide in COVID genome, they are very close by in the tree, even though they are very far apart on the surface. So this is this will help motivate me to re-enter uh, the computational biology field in 2016. And I did a few papers before the pandemic, mostly on RNA folding, uh, like using incremental parsing algorithms to derive linear time folding algorithms. Um, but this line of work becomes much more interesting during the COVID, uh, where we, we uh, did very high impact papers in like Nature and PNS on MRA vaccine design and um, you know uh, finding therapeutic targets on SARS-CoV-2 genomes, which I'll, I'll kind of give you a bit more details in this talk. Uh, but please do stop me if you have any questions. Uh, I would like to be uh, very interactive. Um, and first, some background: Why RNA folding can be viewed as natural language parsing? Well, the input is just a sentence, which is ACGU sequence. I don't know what's uh, and so maybe I should use this. Um, and why is the syntactic structure or the, the bracketing structure, like the corresponding bracket, the corresponding uh, brackets pair? So this, you know, so that you form, you fold into this kind of structure. And this structure is very much just a parse tree because it's very recursive and hierarchical and it can be modeled by a context-free grammar, just like we had in, in English, you know, parse tree, right? So we can use the same parsing algorithms that we, our field invented in the 1960s to, uh, to, to fold, in our, our, uh, fold our RNAs. And that's exactly what was done. So 1965, CKY and cubic time, and the same folding algorithms is invented, reinvented actually in biology field in around 1980. Um, same complexity, N is this sequence length, it's cubic time, it's very slow, bottom up, CKY, same algorithm. Sorry. Um, yes, yeah. What, what, what exactly are those kind of connections? Are they just kind of near? They're base, base pairs. Base pairs means, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, they are hydrogen bonds. So these, this, you know, here is the backbone, like GC, blah, 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 that's the whole sequence. But in nature, they, they fold into kind of compact shape, like protein folding, for example, right? Very far apart, uh, amino acids will, will kind of residual will fold apart, just like language. Like if I give you a language, what do you serve chicken with? Even though there's what and with far apart in the, in the surface, on the surface, but they are actually together on the dependency structure, right? So same thing, they, they form base pairs, which are hydrogen bonds in chemistry, but they, they, they put, they're close by in nature, right? So it, how, how do you get such kind of annotations to people? Yeah, people them? actually have tree banks, in, in other words. You have tree banks for English, for Chinese, you have tree banks, or we call it structure databases or whatever for proteins and RNAs. Yes, right. So actually like AlphaFold is trained on these protein tree banks, you can imagine that way, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Any other clarification questions? Very good. Uh, and these, they are too slow. Imagine N is COVID, COVID scale is N is, 30,000 and you can you cannot finish it uh, so many years ago like more than 10 years ago I did linear time parsing incremental parsing like as you hear me speak right now you're doing incremental parsing in your brain even though you're not aware of it um, but I just basically applied my own to uh, RNA and that was the first major speed up uh, in RNA folding in 40 years because the two fields stopped talking to each other and you know they got stuck with CKY for since 1980, they kept using CKY for 40 years until um, until I, I invented this linear fold algorithm. And linear fold is really linear time, so you can see it scales linearly with sequence length. On SARS-CoV-2, it can reduce the folding time from one hour to half a minute. Uh, and interestingly, you will think, well, so this linear fold is a, lin uh, a kind of approximate dynamic programming algorithm using beam search. So it's based on dynamic programming, but you still apply beam search on top of it. I won't. Go any go into any details, but you might think that because it's approximate, uh, you would make search errors. You would be slightly worse in, in terms of accuracy. But actually, in both linguistics and biology, we found that uh, it's actually slightly better uh, in terms of accuracy. 
especially uh, for longer sequences. Uh, for the two longest families in RNA, we actually significantly better. And we found that in, in natural energy parsing as well, because our models are not very accurate. So if you do search, if your models are not perfectly accurate, then of course you want to do very good search. But because our models are never perfect, so sometimes you do slightly worse search, you got actually a bit more accurate results when you compare to the tree bank to the annotation. And also for long range based pairs, that those are very hard to predict, right? So it's like far apart, they still come together, especially at the beginning and the end. Uh, there are studies that show that in both linguistics and the biology, the end to end distance is rather small. Because regardless of how long your sentence is, the end to end distance in the syntactic distance, your surface distance is huge, but syntactic distance is very short. Same thing for biology. But that's you know prehistory uh, of this talk. The important part of this talk is when COVID hits, right? When COVID hits, I was asking my asking myself in January of 2020, how can my work help uh, fight the pandemic? Well, I know it could help fight the pandemic because I was doing RNA folding, and this is an RNA virus, the longest RNA virus known today. In fact, that's part of the reason why it's so so causing us so much trouble. But I wanted to do something more direct. Uh, more kind of direct impact. So I asked my friend Riju Das from Stanford Medical School, uh, how can our stuff be more useful? And he said, initially he had no idea. And after a week he said, I got a great idea. Come to Stanford, we'll talk. And I, I went to Stanford with my two to my students and he gave me a two hour mini lecture um, on mRNA vaccine. Of course I had no biology background, so I did not know anything about vaccine, uh, not to mention mRNA vaccine, because nobody knows mRNA vaccine back in 2020, uh, January 2020. But he told me that mRNA vaccine is a great, but there's a major problem that you want to solve right now. That's there's a catch. There's the stability problem. So so he said, you know, we should work on it. Now, that's how I started working on this mRNA design problem. So as we all know now, mRNA vaccine are great, right? Much better than traditional protein based vaccines uh, because it gives you source code not the executable executables and your cells uh, are responsible to translate the source code that is the mri into the executables that are the, 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 the proteins so for example you want to translate into the spike protein of covid which would induce antibodies but although mri vaccines are much better than protein in many um many don't many features like fast mass production no risk of infection blah 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 there's a catch the catch is RNAs are very unstable compared to proteins or, or DNAs. So they cannot last very long, they, they, they easily degrade. Once they degrade, they got cut into pieces, they cannot be translated to the spike protein that you wanted. And as a result, you got less antibody response and you got less protection. So the question really is, how do you design more stable and efficient mRNA sequences? using computational methods, not, not using like chemistry or, or biology, but just using in silico computational algorithms to design better sequences. And the answer is yes. But before I talk about the solution, I'll, I'll first introduce the problem. It's a very simple mathematical problem, but it's a very hard one. So protein translation, you know, if you give, you're given an mRNA sequence, then to translate into the protein, it's deterministic uh, because there is a, Hold on table, there's, there's a genetic code uh, where uh, you have, uh, so each amino acid is encoded by three triplet codons, uh, sorry, uh, by, by three triplet, uh, by a triplet codon, which is three consecutive nucleotides. So so like AUG, you say, oh, AUG is meth methionine, then UUA is phenylalanine, then GUU is valine, so on and so forth. But the design problem is the inverse problem of that, that is, what kind of mRNA sequences can translate to the spike protein? But then that problem becomes non-deterministic because of the redundancy in the genetic code, right? So you have only 20 amino acids, but you have 64 triplet codons, okay? Because you have you need four to the power of three. Four to the power of two is not enough, right? But then 64 is a lot more than 20. So each one has sometimes one, or sometimes two or three or four or five or six different codons. And if you multiply the number of choices all together, let's say Vedian, you can choose any one of these four, Leucine, you can choose any one of these six, and so on and so forth. And that's a combinatorial explosion problem, obviously. You got 10 to the power of 600 or something, which is more than the atoms in the universe. If you 
you know, enumerate one by one, it would take billions and billions and billions of years. You couldn't finish before the universe ends. So, and each one of them are, they're all uh, paraphrases, meaning they're all synonymous. They all trans translate to the same protein. They all can serve as a vaccine candidate. But which ones do you prefer? Well, it's very funny. Moderna published a paper right before the pandemic in December of, of 2019 PNAS, suggesting that you wanted the most stable mRNA because the sta more stable, it lasts longer, it produces more protein, which is very intuitive. Um, but the real question is how? How do you find the more stable or most stable one in this huge space without enumeration, enumerating it one by one? Well, in his office, I said, in Richard's office in Stanford, I said, maybe I, I have some, some ways to solve it. He said, forget about it, even though hope is MP-hard. Uh, so his idea is to use crowdsourcing plus my linear fold as a scorer, and he want, wanted to launch another campaign called Open Vaccine. But I said, you know, maybe I can solve it. He didn't believe in me, but after after a few weeks, we, we solved it. And turns out it's a very simple problem in linguistics, which we solved in 1961, 60 years before the pandemic. And we only need two ideas from uh, natural language processing. But any questions so far uh, that I should address? Okay. So, so yeah, they need to be stable. Sorry, but that's stable. Oh yeah, what does stable mean? Yes, very very good question. Being stable means the free energy is minimized. So in, in, in physics, the lower the energy, the more stable. And in kind of structure, it means actually you form more pairs. Basically, you can roughly speak meaning you form more pairs. You you're more kind of compactly folded onto yourself. You don't want to be loose. If you're loose, unpaired, then you got cut down into pieces. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, okay, so we borrowed two ideas from classical natural energy processing to solve this problem, very hard problem. Uh, and at the end of the day, we'll see that, oh, you know, this MRE design problem, a new problem in COVID can be reduced to an old problem uh, in natural energy processing. The first idea is a representation called word lattice. That's basically, you know, a kind of DFA or kind of a graph with, with, with words on edges uh, coming from speech recognition. Um, and this word lattice is the space of alternative alternative hypothesis uh, when you do speech recognition. Because it, like in the old days, when you do speech recognition, you cannot hear clearly whether it's VO or MIO, and then you, you put all the alternatives together back into the word lattice. We use the same idea to uh, represent the search space, the design space for MRI design. For example, most of the time, it's only the third letter that has a choice, that has a ambiguity, so C and U packet here. Valian only the last letter has a choice. Uh, and leucine is slightly different because it has six different choices. You have a slightly more complex uh, DFA. Uh, and stop codon has this kind of thing. And then you stitch all the individual MRE lattices or DFAs together. Uh, you got a humongous, uh, you got a very thin but very long uh, MRE lattice. And that lattice or DFA contains 10 to the 600 something path, right? Each beginning to the end path, global path, represents represents a valid COVID vaccine sequence, right? But that does not solve the problem, right? Because you just change the representation, it's just the same thing. The real question here is, how do you find the most stable path? Or in other words, in biophysics, the lowest free energy path among all these paths without enumerating these paths, right? So luckily, there is something called lattice parsing from, from the uh, classical NLP literature. Uh, and that's from actually 1961. So as I said, if you do speech recognition, at least in the old days, you need a word lattice because there are a lot of alternatives. And in isolation of context, you cannot differentiate or disambiguate, disambiguate whether it's a veal or a meal. Uh, but of course, with context, you can disambiguate. But you put all these things together in a word lattice, and then you use an algorithm called lattice parsing, and you're given lattice and a grammar, like English grammar encoding grammaticality, and then you can parse all these sentences simultaneously without enumerating one by one. Uh, and in very short amount of time, you can find the most grammatical, or the most likely, the most plausible sentence, which is I like this meal with its uh, syntactic structure. Okay, so that's a very fast dynamic programming algorithm. And we just took the same algorithm, except that the ingredients are now different. So the input is not, not a word lattice, but an MRE lattice. And the grammar 
is also not an English grammar, but an RNA folding grammar. And this RNA folding grammar looks very much like an English grammar or Chinese grammar, except that the parameters are different, right? Uh, the parameters are not about grammaticality, but now about more about stability. Like if you form an AU pair, how much energy do you get? If you form a GC pair, how much energy do you get? Right? It could be positive or negative. And then you run the same algorithm. The algorithm doesn't change. And you can fold all these sentences to, sequences together and find the most frequent one. I'm uh, sorry, mo mo most stable one along it, with, with this secondary structure. Right? In, in, in a, just about 11 minutes. Right? And this algorithm that is parsing had its root uh, in 1961. So Bach Hillel et al. solved this problem 60 years before the pandemic. Yeah, I just. Uh, found a new life for for this classical album, so that I was able to reduce a new problem MR design into a very very old problem, completely unexpected connection. And for for folks with a computer science background, uh, here's some little bit more detail about lattice parsing. So lattice parsing is just a simple generalization of the classical CKY parsing algorithm from single sequence to a DFA or a lattice. So CKY, which was invented by C and K and Y, three different people uh, independently of each other, uh, Koch, Kasami, and Younger, uh, around 1964, 1965, is actually a special case of lattice parsing where the lattice is a single chain, right? Well, if your graph reduces to a single chain, then, then you, you're basically doing CKY. Yeah. But the funny thing is, lattice parsing, bach construction was published four years before CKY. And yet it was an, generalization of CKY. So CKY, even though it's much more famous uh, than lattice parsing, it's actually a special case of something published way earlier. Uh, and the other interpretation in formal language theory and comp theoretical computer science is something that we teach in theory of computation in undergraduate or graduate course, that is context-free languages are not closed under intersection. We all know that. But context-free language intersect with a regular language, or in other words, CFG with DFA, you got another context-free language. Uh, which you got a gr bigger grammar. And you can prove by construction by constructing the bigger grammar, uh, G prime. And that's essentially uh, the proof uh, of, of why this intersection it becomes another context free language. And that's essentially the same Bahio construction. So, in other words, in CKY, you have I, J, Ks, right? So that's why it's cubic time on the length of sequence. If you generalize that into, uh, instead of I, J, K indices, you generalize into nodes in the lattice or DFA or states in the DFA, then PQR, you just need to enumerate the triplets, triplet uh, states, state triplets in DFA. So that's why it's still cubic time, but now cubic in the number of states in the DFA. So that's why it's just a simple generalization of CKY. And that's why CKY is a trivial single chain special case of lattice parsing. Okay. So Baki Leo, is actually uh, was actually a pioneer of machine translation, even though very, very, very few people knew, knew who, she, who he is. And I would say he, uh, he would knew that his algorithm would have a new life 60 years later. Uh, that was really unexpected. Uh, so some, some results. Um, so as, as I said, this is very efficient algorithm. It only takes 11 minutes to find the most stable sequence for spike protein of, of SARS-CoV-2, but Here's the, the result before our optimization. Before our optimization, the sequence in the, the wild type sequence, meaning the original sequence in the, in the virus genome, is very unstable. You can see that it has a lot of uh, single-stranded parts, right? And single-stranded parts, like unpaired parts, are easily degraded or cut down to pieces. But after just 11 minutes of op optimization, you got a completely different sequence. But they, they both code they both translate to the same spike protein. They are synonymous. They, you know, they are paraphrases of each other. But this sequence is completely different and with a completely different shape after folding. You can see that it's mostly double-stranded. In a way, we actually transform the RNA into more like a DNA. It's all double-stranded. Like you can imagine if it's double-stranded, it's harder, much harder to, to cut down, right? Yeah, so the single-stranded regions are very, very rare here. And we can prove mathematically that this is indeed the lowest free energy sequence among all the 10 to the power of 600 some alternatives. So this is the uh, algorithm part, the in silico part, which was done just you know in April of 2020. Everything you know 
everybody was rushing really hard uh, during the first few months of 2020 because you know, everybody wanted to help fight the pandemic. Uh, and once we released the preprint, uh, many companies, biology uh, and pharmaceutical companies saw it and they wanted to kind of uh, do experiments for, for, for us. And we paired with uh, Stemin RNA Therapeutics, uh, which is a leading firm in, in China. And they did experiments on COVID and another vaccine. And their results are very surprising. They show that on COVID mRNA vaccine, we can lead to more than a hundred fold increase in antibody response uh, compared to the standard method, which is called code optimization used by all the vaccine companies like BioNTech, Pfizer, Moderna, and CureVac. Um, and it's also significantly better than the BioNTech Pfizer sequence that almost everybody here got uh, in, in both binding and, and neutralized antibody responses and also on better on other vaccine. So here's some, we're getting more into the the well lab stuff, but because most folks are uh, computer science back, have computer science background, so I, you know, do stop me if you have any questions. So here we're doing actually a two-dimensional optimization, even though we only mentioned the first dimension before before this slide. So we only mentioned stability or free energy. That is, you want to get lower, the, the, the lower the better, the more negative the better, meaning you want to move to the left, to the left on the x-axis. But there's also a y axis. The second dimension is the transition efficiency, right? So roughly speaking, on the x axis is controlling how stable you are or how, how long you can sustain your half life or how many hours can you can you sustain. But on the y axis is about efficiency of translation within this unit amount of time, like per hour, how much proteins can you get? So Moderna's paper suggests that you want to be building both dimensions. You want to go be both a long distance runner and also a good sprinter, like, like you can run longer, but you also run fast. So the y-axis is also controlled by the CAI index, the codon adaptation index, also known as codon optimality. So this idea is very simple. Like I said, each amino acid, you can have multiple codons, triple codons, but they are not equal, really. I mean, they're, they all translate to the same amino acid, but uh, they have different frequencies in the human genome. Like human genome prefers like CUG, GC-rich codons, CUG, but dislikes uh, AU-rich codons like CUA. So you would, you want to increase the efficiency of translation. You want to use the frequent codons and avoid rare codons, right? But that's a local optimization problem, very easy. Just per amino acid, you always you know prefer a uh, CUG and not prefer the CUA. That, that's very local, whereas our optimization is a global optimization. But previous work is only doing codon optimization. And uh, code optimization, even though it uh, improves translation efficiency, but it also improves stability a little bit, a tiny little bit here, because just because it happens to be the case that human genomes prefer GC-rich codons and GC pairs are more stable than AU pairs you know, in physics. But the two directions are mostly orthogonal, right? So the, the, the angle is really big uh, and, and this, this improvement it's very small in terms of energy. Whereas we can go all the way to the left, to the most stable region, okay? And Moderna already knows, uh, they, when they published that paper, they already knew that if they should go left. They just don't know how. They tried a lot of local random mutations. It doesn't get very far. It's tried millions and millions of alternatives. It's still around, around here. If you want to cross this dashed line, you need millions of years, right? Because it's, it's really a, combinatorial explosion problem. And the Pfizer BioNTech sequence and the CureVac sequence, they're all around this area, right? So this is the first time we can go here. Uh, and uh, here we can, con Lambda is the hyperparameter controlling the weight of the second dimension, the, the codon, codon optimality dimension. If Lambda is zero, that means you only care about stability. And if lambda is infinity, that means you only care about codon optimality, and then you're back to codon optimization. And there's there's a trade-off between the two, right? And okay, so so we can do joint optimization. Uh, and the wild type that we showed on previous slide is very bad in both. Like the original sequence in the viral genome genome is bad in both energy and codon optimality. So here's the experimental results on COVID mRNA vaccine. So we designed about seven or eight sequences here. Uh, and here's the baseline H, which is called optimization. We're very close to the Pfizer sequence. Uh, and you can see that in gel run, gel run means like if you're more compactly uh, structured, 
you're tightly folded, you run the fastest, you run the furthest away. If you, you like your H, our baseline runs the slowest. Our A, the most more stable one, runs the fastest. It correlates very well with the energies we predicted. Like say, for example, D, E, F have roughly the same energy and they run roughly the same speed. And G is the slower uh, uh, and H is even the, the slowest, right? So they, they, they correlate extremely well. And half-life, half-life also, half-life is like, uh, you know, so this is like after 16 hours, sequence H has how many percentage being completely intact or, or not graded, not, not full length, non, non uh, degraded sequence, right? But sequence H quickly dies out, uh, you know, so the half-life is only four hours and our A is, sorry, 20 hours. And they also correlate very well with the energy predicted here. And D is protein expression. Protein expression, we're also significantly better than H. And then E and F are binding and, and, and neutralizing antibody. And here we have more than a hundred fold increase in binding antibody uh, titer, meaning the, the antibody response is so much better than the baseline. Yeah. And 20 times better in neutralizing antibody titer. So the results are very, very shocking. So when we submitted to Nature, one of the reviewers is what was extremely picky. So he said, why don't you compare with the most widely used MRE vaccine sequence that is from BioNTech Pfizer? Because a lot of people in the United States got those shots, um, which is slightly unfair because you know, the other reviewers said, you know, this is a well-known product and you're a research project, project. This is not you know, comparable, but nevertheless, we, we did a head-to-head -head comparison, meaning everything being equal. It's a control variable approach. It's only the coding sequence is different. So we took their, their code, coding sequence of Pfizer-BioNTech sequence and compared with other uh, ours. And on this 2D plot, this Pfizer-BioNTech sequence is indeed very close to our baseline H in terms of energy or stability and the code optimality. And indeed, in terms of half-life, it's very close or slightly worse actually than, than our baseline. But in terms of protein expression, it's actually better than our H, but a lot worse than our A and C. And in terms of antibody, they are also significantly worse than our A and C. And the editor of the Nature Journal also suggested, he's, he's an immunologist, he suggested that, um, you, because this is an algorithm that can be applied to anything, right? It's not a, just for specific disease. You should show the generality at least on one more vaccine, on one more antigen. So we did uh, another var virus, varicella, sosto virus, and also worked very well. Yeah. And just to quickly summarize this part, um, so we show that classical NLP algorithm have a new life, a completely unexpected new life in designing more stable and efficient MRIs that we were able to kind of reduce this new problem to an old problem, mm -hmm. surprising connection. Uh, and it can be used beyond vaccines, can also be used for therapeutics. Uh, and it has been already raised the lessons to some of you, one of the biggest um, pharmaceuticals. Uh, and Nature not only published our paper, but also published a news report uh, that remarkable AI tools, blah, 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 and also a technical commentary and so on and so forth. Uh, and here's a, Funny little story, as as Rin Tan mentioned, um, a few weeks ago I went to a conference in Berlin called uh, International MRA Health Conference, uh, co-organized by this year's Nobel Prize winner Kathleen Carricos. So Kathleen Carrico won the Nobel Prize because of the the, the contributions of MRA vaccine, right? So this field actually won the Nobel Prize this year, uh, but using a completely different method from mine is she used a, a chemistry method, a chemical method of chemical modification that is completely orthogonal to our computational methods. These two methods can be you know, complementary and uh, combined. But during her keynote, she actually uh, kind of joked about my, my, my work. She made, made fun of my work in front of everybody. She said, today there was a mathematician uh, who doesn't know uh, biology, uh, who doesn't know immunology. Like there was a difference between mice and human and, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, and everybody laughed in, in the audience. And I was like, she's probably talking about me because I, I'm probably the only person who can be called a mathematician. And then I talked to her. She's actually a very friendly person, very nice person. Uh, he said, yeah, yeah, you, you know what? I just joked about your work, right? So, but yeah, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, and anyways, so that, that's a funny little story. And we built a web server that everybody can use. Um, and I would like to 
take some questions if, if you have any for, for this part before I move on to the second part. And the second part will be much shorter. Um, yeah, any questions for the first part? No, okay. Okay, good. So the other, the second story uh, during COVID was about therapeutics and diagnostics uh, instead of vaccine. And it's another, yet another application of NLP to biology. So we, we've talked about a lot of applications uh, because the, the parallel between linguistics and biology um, is just has so many so many applications. So we talk about in incremental parsing to linear fold, lattice parsing to linear design. And finally, there's something called synchronous parsing, which nobody knows right now, but it was very popular more than 10 years ago in machine translation. So for folks who did machine translation before, you know, there's a problem there, you have a bi-text and sometimes you want to parse both, you know, say English and, and Chinese and also align them, do word alignment because they are translations of each other. And because the word order is quite different, like if you have English and Japanese or German, then you have you know, SVO or SOV or whatever. Uh, so it's very interesting to study the parse trees of both languages and, and, and the word, word order and, and the rearrangement and so and, and, and word order and, and stuff like that. Uh, and this idea has application in COVID as well. That is called homologous folding. Homologous folding is like fold and align. And by the way, fold is just parse, right? Fold and so parse and line becomes fold and align, different COVID variants and different, like say, coronaviruses. So you can fold and align SARS CoV 2 with SARS CoV 1, or fold and align Delta with Omicron, or so on and so forth. And that's a very interesting paper that we published at PNAS, um, which is the first homologous folding algorithm to scale to COVID because COVID, as I said, is the longest RNA virus known today. And we were able to do global structural uh, analysis or global kind of fold and line on full, full length COVID genomes. And why do we need to do that? Well, because we want to find conserved and accessible regions of the genome so that we can design diagnostics and therapeutics. Why conserved and, 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 and accessible? Well, conserved because we wanna make sure the drugs we design will stay effective regardless of new variants, right? So you wanna target at the regions where the virus will not change very easily. And also those are the more critical regions, right? Because the not very critical regions, you can keep innovating, you can keep changing, but there are a more conserved critical regions that you need to be stable. Uh, and the other part is that we want to atta attack the single-stranded, the unpaired regions, or the, also known as accessible regions, because they are, you know, as I said, they, they're easily cut down because they are not doubly stranded. Like these parts are double stranded. Uh, they're more like a DNAs, they're, they're like braces, uh, braids. So you want to tar target those kind of loosely or loose parts or accessible parts. But conserved and accessible are actually not, uh, you know, they, they're actually contradictory to each other. Because most of the time, if you're double stranded, if you're paired, you're more conserved, you're more likely to be conserved because there is parity, right? So if you change this A to a C, you need to change this U to a G as well. So it's like there's just zero one parity here. But whereas here, and it, in the unstructured part, you can change anything that without without effects on on structure, right? So to find conserved and accessible regions in the genome is very hard. But once you found those regions, they can be good targets for both diagnostics and therapeutics. And our hope is that it will remain insensitive to both existing and future mutations or variants. Uh, and so, and it will be more sensitive to existing diagnostics and therapeutics tools. So, as I said, um, by developing linear time algorithms inspired by computation linguistics, we were able to develop the first kind of homologous folding algorithm for that I can scale to COVID. And because it's linear time is very fast, and we were able to fold the whole genome together, and especially detecting end to end pairs that are extremely far apart on the surface, but rather close in nature in the foliar structure. Like it's actually almost 30,000 nucleotides apart. And the most surprising thing is that this prediction matches a purely experimental study 
extremely well. Pair by pair, not even a pair is different. That's completely unexpected. Um, yeah, and pre yeah pre previous FFs never were able to do that because they were only doing the windowed approach. Uh, like like in, like if you have GPU memory limit, you can only you know, fold like a thousand or five hundred nucleotides together. You have a sliding window approach, but we were able to fold the whole thing together so that you can do end to end pairs. So this is very encouraging, and and also we we show that homologous folding is better than single sequence folding, because just by looking at related sequences together. Uh, you can actually kind of fold into, and you know that they, they are all related. They are all like variants of COVID. They are related, so they should have similar structures. So you, you can actually have much better structure prediction once you, have, you consider many sequences together. And also, uh, so I'll just quickly go to the results. You can find conserved and accessible regions if you also consider relatives of SARS-CoV-2, not just SARS-CoV-2, Variants, uh, because SARS-CoV-2 variants are still too similar to each other, because SARS-CoV-2 has only been around for three years. So even though like Omicron is quite different from the original Wuhan virus, uh, their similarity is still more than ninety-nine percent. So you, you, it's not enough time to change that much. But if you look, compare SARS-CoV-2 with SARS-CoV-1, so SARS-CoV-1 was like two thousand three. There was another virus. Uh, uh, very similar to SARS-CoV-2, but uh, it's also in China. But um, that virus, SARS-CoV-1, has only 80 percent, 79 or 80 percent similarity with SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. So, so their common ancestor was probably uh, I don't know how many years ago. And also other cor coronavirus sequences we found in bats, uh, other animals, and so on and so forth. So those are called SARS-related, uh, SARS-related uh, genomes. If we include those SARS-related genomes, then you can find historically conserved and accessible regions. We found 30 of them, or 33 of them, and they are you know, good candidates for therapeutics and diagnostics. And the more interesting thing is that this prediction actually stood the test of time when Omicron came along. So this paper was published before Omicron, but when Omicron came along uh, and became a global concern, my students went back to look at our predictions, and you know what? None of our predicted regions, our you know conserved regions, were affected by Omicron mutations. So Omicron didn't dare to make any single letter change in the 33 regions that we considered important or or like conserved or critical. Like they they changed a lot of other places, but they were not able to. They 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 they, they didn't dare to change anything that we we prescribed to be important. So this this suggests that our predictions, uh, our prescribed regions that you can make drugs for will, will likely remain insensitive to future mutations. And actually, we cannot predict future mutations, but we can just say, because historically, these regions did not change, then it's likely that in the future, it's also not going to change because it's so critical to the virus, uh, the survival, uh, survival of the virus. So the virus actually didn't want to change that region. Yeah. So that, that's very good because new variants of COVID keeps you know, popping up every day. Uh, and uh, you don't want your drugs to be, you have to redesign your drugs as a new variant comes up. You know, you want something that will remain insensitive, remain effective uh, to future mutations. So with that, I would like to conclude that, I think I've convinced you that linguistics and biology are just two sides of the same coin. And I listed a lot of parallels between language and biology. And some of them I, I talked about today and others I didn't have time to talk about, like inside, outside, out, which is widely used in NLP before the deep learning uh, revolution. It's also widely used in, in, in biology as well, um, related to kind of alternative meanings or ambiguities in language and so on and so forth, uh, so that we want to model the kind of distribution of structures. Uh, but today, the most, two most exciting stories that I talked about are lattice parsing for MRI design and the synchronous parsing of homologous voting. And I think by now you're convinced that these two modalities are just you know, two sides of the same coin. And I would like to thank you for your attention. I can take questions. Thank you. Thank you, folks.
Any questions? I have a question. Sure. Uh, sorry, who's asking a question? This is Will Merrill, remote. Hi. Attendant. Hi, Will. Hi. Hi. Um, so I, I really like this this work as someone with a, a, form, a formal language background. It's very cool to see. Yeah. Um, oh like, yeah, you you, you you did a lot of work on on, on formal language and, and like deep learning's expressivity on formal language. Is that is that you who, who did those? That's that's me. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so my, my question is about the first part of the talk about the um, context-free parsing and mm -hmm. protein folding. So I guess this analogy between like uh, cross context-free dependencies and uh, like hydrogen bonds, I think you said. Yeah. So I'm wondering, like, one of the limitations of context-free grammars for natural language is that we obviously have like cross serial dependencies that violate yeah. the tree structure. Is there some analog of that here where there's like interactions besides these hydrogen bonds, or in this case, it, does the context-free structure like much more closely match the like physical structure? That's a wonderful question. I I'm really glad that you asked this question and. Uh, Yes, I should clarify that just as in language, context three grammar is often not enough, uh, but it captures most of the interesting parts. Uh, so there is a you know evidence that you know, some languages like Dutch and Swiss German are beyond context three uh, with cross serial dependencies, as as uh, Will, Will mentioned. So in fact, the same kind of crossing dependencies, crossing pairs appear in in RNAs and proteins as well, um, much more in proteins, but in RNAs much more rarely, but but still exist. They, they do exist, even though not not very it's like you know the like, uh non-projective dependencies or cross zero, you know uh do have dependencies. They, they are rare, but they, they are just quite important actually uh in some some structures, especially in COVID. Um so by doing context free parsing, we I admit that I have to give up those kind of not like beyond context three or, or like mildly context-sensitive structures, like they are called pseudonauts. Pseudonauts are like basically cross zero dependencies. Uh, but so far, uh, we, we were able to capture the bulk part of the interesting part. Like for example, when we do energy, when we design more stable MRAs, uh, this context three approximation seems to be good enough, right? So at least it's supported by wild lab experiments that uh, you know it, it's 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 good approximation. Uh, and if you want to go beyond context free parsing, yeah, there are a lot of work on you know using n to the four, n to the five, n to the six elements uh, to parse to predict those structures with pseudonauts. Those those are very very slow. The way to, I mean, you know, people always wanted me to develop linearized algorithms for 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 those cases, but they're, they're much much more challenging. Uh, and proteins have way more uh, non context free structures. So proteins, well, most most of the structures are still context free. Uh, like if you know this, uh, we'll call uh, um, anti parallel beta sheets, but there are also parallel beta sheets which are exactly cross serial dependencies in, in nature, uh, in language, right? Uh, so, the, so that's why protein folding is much harder, uh, to model as a conic three, or in other words, conic three parsing is a worse approximation, uh, for protein folding than for, for RNA. For RNA, my, my gut feeling is conic three is largely enough largely enough unless you want to really pin down to the very interesting across uh pseudonaut structures yeah and and actually that that connects back to my my advisor story because he was his you know he's well known for for developing mildly conic sensitive uh grammars like trio joining grammars uh and his application was you know those cross serial or another crossing structures like in dutch and, and swiss german and he you know, the paper that he read was actually applying triadjoining grammars to pseudonauts in, in proteins, oh, sorry, in RNAs. And that's how he got interested in this field originally, like more than 20 years ago. Yeah, so so your question, you know, very nicely connected all these dots that I, I didn't have time to mention. Thank you. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, that was great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah, just if I can annotate, oh, I was not able to annotate anything. It, like there can be crossing pairs. It's not just well nested, well nested brackets, but you can have crossing pairs, yes, but not too much. Yeah. Uh, any other questions?
Great. So if not, let's start the speaker again. Thank you. Yes.